there's always an opportunity for us to learn more, to become wiser, to develop in our Christian walk, to become more the person that God desires us to be. You see, if you were left to your own devices, while you may think of yourself as having planned out your world and your way in retirement accounts or vocation or some type of career or profession that you want to be, God himself wrote your name in his book of life long before you were ever born. He designed the world to accommodate you in such a way that it would cause you to know him in a personal and intimate way, to relate to him and to begin to deal with him on a one-to-one -one level that you have no concept and no realization of until you finally come to that place of being born again. Once you are born again, once you become born of the same spirit that God raised Jesus from the dead, the spirit of God, then you have the ability to hear. You have the ability to see things you've never seen before. You have the capability of hearing God's voice. But until you do, nothing that is really shared on video will make much sense to you because you will not be able to comprehend what God is saying to you. Today in Tozer, he speaks to our intelligence level and addresses us in certain ways that maybe will upset you or cause you some frustration because you think you're so wise in the world, but you're really so ignorant in the things of the Spirit. Because he addresses all of us that way. All of us need to grow in the knowledge of God and the knowledge of His way as opposed to our way. Divine love, the necessity for the church on earth. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God says unto the churches. From Revelation 3, 21-22. The kind of Christianity that relies upon the influence of its own human and earthly power makes God sick. Can I repeat that? because I personally enjoy Tozer saying it, because if I say it, people say, Oh, brother, don't judge me. Oh, don't, don't tell me what to do. Oh, who are you to judge my heart? You don't know my heart. God knows me. God loves me, so you, know, you don't judge me. Let's read Tozer again and understand exactly what he's saying. The kind of Christianity that relies upon the influence of its own human and earthly power makes God sick. For the Church of Jesus Christ is a heavenly institution, not an earthly one. For myself, if I could not have the divine power of God, I would walk out and quit the whole religious business. For myself personally, I always tell people the same thing in some ways. I like to relate it to, if God's not real, get out. If you haven't proven to yourself that God is demonstratively in the scientific process, you haven't gone out and proven to yourself that God is real. Quit being a religious hypocrite. Quit being what you are and just go out, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you die. Literally. But once you begin to go on that trail of deciding to prove that God exists, you'll find more than enough evidence of God revealing himself to you that he will intervene in your life at some point in time and reveal himself to you in such a way that you'll have no doubt ever again that God is real. That happens when we are born again. But until you do that, until you prove to yourself, till you demonstrate beyond any shadow of a fact of a doubt, at some point in time, in one moment in your life, that that's true, you'll never be what God intends you to be. Because you'll always be tossed to and fro by this pastor or that pastor, by this emotion or that emotion, by thinking you have this gift or that gift, or doing something religiously that makes God sick because he didn't tell you to do it, did he? The church that wants God's power will have something to offer besides social clubs, knitting societies, and all the other side business groups that we see so often prevalent in the church today. I mean, haven't you gone to a church program and seen all the things to get involved politically? Haven't you gone to a church or a mega church and seen all the things that you can do to stop this abortion, to stop this rights or privileges, to stop these people from doing that or that people from doing this, you know, getting involved in your issues group, you know, relating it to the Bible, of course, 
but really have you talked to or had discourse with the personal living God? Because until you do, you're wasting your time getting involved in politics, issues, and social occasions that have nothing to do with what God told you to do. That's what Tozer's saying. Are you doing what God told you to do? If any church is to be a church of Christ, the living organic member of that redeemed body of which Jesus is the head, then its teachers and its members must strive earnestly and sacrificially with constant prayer to do a number of things. I see so often and I try to tell people, look, if you're part of a mega church and you're part of a mega ministry and you walk inside and you're greeted by a greeter, that's a professional humanistic endeavor. That's not the pastor talking to you, is it? That's not as though somebody really cares whether you're there or not. It's somebody who's been told, taught, prepared, and given the office of greeting you. They're usually smiley people, you know. You've met them before, haven't you? You know, at a sales convention, you know, the meet and greet kind of people. You know, the ones that are always wearing the nice suits and they always look so perfect. You know, they're the ones that come up to you, you know, and give you a hug and a kiss and say, hey, welcome, come on in, you know, get seated, you know, we're glad you're here. And then try to see where they are later, after church, or down the road. Where did they go? What happened? How come I don't get that meet and greet in the morning when I wake up? You see, there's a lot of professionalism that's invaded the church. It's called humanism, and it's a way of making you feel welcome humanistically. But God says, hey, that's not the kind of body that I desire for you to be a part of. I desire for someone who makes a sacrifice to get to know you. Someone who really is willing to take the time and make the time to be with you when you're in trouble or you struggle or you don't show up for church that Sunday. Until you find that body of individual believers that you connect with, that you feel you're intimate with, that you really develop that kind of relationship, you have no idea what Jesus intended for his church. Because what you're looking at is a man-made imitation of what God intended for the body of believers to be. Jesus said and took his disciples with him everywhere he went. They lived, they breathed, they enjoyed, and they suffered all the same together. It wasn't as though they pulled the card and said, hey, I'll give you my 10%. No, they sold everything they had, they gave up what they possessed, and they followed Jesus to the That's the kind of relationship that God desires for you to have with other people involved in your life. Oh, sure, God may bless you once you've done that, and he may challenge you later in life to give it all up again, kind of like Abraham. You know, Abraham finally gets the promise that God promised him. And then God says, okay, now take your son and sacrifice him on the altar. Take now the son whom you love and sacrifice him. Take now the promise that I've given you and sacrifice it on the altar. And Abraham took three days to get there, but by the time he got there, he was ready. Now, I don't know about you or me, I would have taken three days to figure it out whether or not it was God speaking to me or not. <laughs> you know. And then finally, in the end, I'm still not sure what I would have done. But if we are faithful to God, then we trust Him with all of our heart, meaning not in our own understanding, which is really what those are saying. Don't think you're smart enough to figure out what God is saying. Do what God says, and then He'll make you smart enough to figure out what He's doing after you've done it. Because believe me, before you do it, you will have no clue what God is doing until you do it. Because that's what God wants from us. He doesn't want our religious activities. He wants our faithfulness. We must strive to make our beliefs and practices New Testament in their content, not just their portent. We must teach and believe New Testament truths. We must live what we say we will do. We must do what we say we live. There must be no difference between what Jesus said and live and what we say and live. If we don't know, don't do it. But if we do know, then do it. We must teach and believe the New Testament truths with nothing dragged in from the outside. You see, any time that you mix worldliness with godliness, you dilute what God is trying to do with you. Every time that you compromise the truth of God by adding something that says, you don't, you know, you got grace, so you know, don't don't take it so seriously that you're 
you know, no earthly good, you know, that you're so heavenly minded. But I say unto you, if you're so heavenly minded, you are all earthly good, because in reality, this is not good, what you're about and what you're in. This world is not good. It's evil. It has been. It's under corruption and has been cursed. So what you think of as so gorgeous as far as God creating is under a curse that God has to remove before you can see exactly what God intended the world to be. The same thing is true with you. You have no idea until God removes the curse of sin from you what God has intended for you to be. You will be like Jesus. You will have the same joys, the same peace, the same long-suffering, the same meekness, the same kindness, the same gentleness, the same tenderness, the same aspect of the Son of God when God is done with you. But until then, God isn't done with you or finished. And in reality, when you think you've arrived, you're probably as far away from God as you ever have been. But when you are down on your knees crying out of how desperate you are for Him to change you because you know how evil your heart is, you're as close to God as you'll ever be in this life until He finally gives you a new life to begin. We must keep our little field of God's planting healthy. And there is only one way to do that. Keep true to the Word of God. Don't fail yourself. And don't fail God's spirit by adding to it the words of men. Cliché Christianity has this whole idea that we need to make it sound palatable so that it's edible, so we can take it in and make it part of our life. You know, cleanliness is next to godliness. No, it's not. Or, you know, you hear them all the time, God won't give you anything bigger than you can handle. Oh, yes, he will. Or, God will close one door and open another door. Oh, no, he won't. Because you see, those are things men say when they dilute the word of God. God's word is true as it is, the way it is, the way it's written to you. When you read that word of God by yourself, with the Spirit of God giving you ears to hear what the Spirit says, you will know the truth. There's no doubt. The first time you read it, you know exactly what it's saying to you. You feel busted. I know. I've been there. And I'm still there every day. When I read the Word of God, I am busted. But the reality is I know God loves me, so He's busting me because He wants me to understand where He's coming from and where I'm going to. Because the reality is I can't get there of my own accord. I can't do it by religious activities. I can only do it by the grace and mercy of God working out in my life. We must live we must constantly go back to the grassroots and get the Word of God back into the Church of God. Because the Church often will add to it all the extra accoutrements to make it look nice, sound nice, be nice, feel nice. People want to be all you can be. They want to find their purpose in life. They want to be the best person that they think God wants them to be. But often, I have to ask the person, or I have to ask you, what did Jesus say? What did Jesus do? Did God tell you to do that? What has God said to you personally? What did Jesus say on the Sermon on the Mount? Did he make it up as though it was something not to be done? Did God waste his breath when he said, blessed is the man who does these things. He will be like a man who builds his house upon a rock. When the storms of life come, he won't be shaken. Or was he just making that up at the end of the Sermon on the Mount so that it was just a high idea and not a reality? See, there's a lot of people that are killing themselves on their own words. They're sticking their lot in life upon commentaries and comments made by people before them or after them that have come along and they've trained up in a certain way of thinking. But when you read the Word of God, the Spirit of God causes you to know exactly what it is for you that he wants you to do. And that's why it's so important not to just listen to the Word of God when you go to a church, even a Bible-believing church that reads the Word of God. 
you need to study the Word of God and have your own time alone with God to speak to Him and have Him reveal to you the truth. Because I don't care what church you're in or what Bible study you go to or what fellowship you're a part of. Everyone needs the reality of a personal God dealing with themselves personally so that they can salvation with fear and trembling. Because once you've read the Word of God and you know what it's saying to you, then you can take that to your brethren and ask them to help you. But don't go there expecting to finally get a word from God because they'll tell me or they'll blow it out of proportion. And something that you need to do out of guilt or something you need to do out of a religious trip or a work trip because you can't fix yourself. You've never been able to, you didn't get saved by fixing yourself, you'll never be able to improve yourself. You'll only be able to read the Word of God and agree with it, what it says about yourself and myself. And that's what Tozer wants us to understand, that without God behind what he's saying, we would all fail miserably because of how condemned we would feel. But we know that God is love, so he's not into condemnation, but affirmation of telling us, yes, you are screwed up. Yes, I do want you to change. Yes, I have conditions. Yes, I will meet those conditions. And yes, I will make you to fulfill those conditions that I have placed upon my salvation I provided for you. That's what Jesus said. You see, while people like to come up with these cute phrases like, God accepts me unconditionally. God loves me unconditionally. That unconditional love will send you to hell too. Because guess what? There are conditions to keep you out of hell rather than have you wind up in hell. And some of those are simply doing what Jesus said. We must live to gear ourselves into the things eternal and to live the life of heaven here on earth, empowered by the Spirit of God with that same power that came on the earliest believers. If not for the Spirit of God, many of us, including myself, would perish. Our health, our wealth, our prosperity, or our barely getting by with what we got would be dried up in an instant, except that the Spirit of God causes us to abundantly be blessed, even in the midst of our poverty, to experience the things that He causes us to grow and to know and to develop into, which is why Jesus sent Him to comfort us in these latter days, because we do need as he said to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne? We need to overcome the world and the worldliness that's in the church. We must put loyalty to Jesus first at any cost. Is Jesus first in your life? Over your mega church, over your pastor, over your elders, over your deacons, over your wife, over your children, over yourself even, and your own thought life, your own idealisms, your own programs of what you think you ought to do, is Jesus first. The reality is, I don't know. I only know this. When I ask God every morning to lead me and to guide me and to abide with me and to fill me with His Spirit so that I can know what it is that He wants me to do, the direction He wants me to go and the words He wants me to say, I can only trust Him with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength to do those things that I have committed unto Him so that He can accomplish His purposes through me that I might not longer be alive but that He would be living in me and that it would no longer be I that live but Christ that liveth in me so that I would accomplish all in my day that He has bestowed upon me the grace and mercy to be alive one more day. And I thank God for that opportunity to do that. Because when I commit it to Him, I can rest in what He does and how He accomplishes His purposes and not my own. Because if it was all about me, if it was me doing it, believe me, you would not be watching and I would not be doing this. We would be off, out, and doing what we want to do with our flesh, which is to usually party hardy. Because guess what? That's the typical fleshy attitude that we have. Now, religious people at times will add to it some kind of motif of making themselves look holy when the reality of what they are inside is what Jesus said about whitewashed sepulchers. Be careful. Be mindful. Don't be concerned about what others are inside, but rather look at ourselves inside and try to bring it on the outside so we can deal with it 
confidently one to each other, as we care for each other in the love of God, that causes us to say, hey, brother, let me help you, not let me condemn you. Let me pray with you, not let me pray for you. Let me be there when you stumble and fall, not let me stomp on you when you have failed my altar call. We must put loyalty to Jesus first at any cost, and anything less than that really is not a Christian church. I can't tell you that there are any churches I recommend. Oh, I say at times, you know, hey, if you want to study the Bible, go to a Calvary Chapel. But I know that lots of Calvary Chapels are just as cold as going to a Catholic church. You know, a lot of people don't get close to you. They, you know, they, they, they might say or wave at you, you know, kind of as you're passing through the door heading to the sanctuary. But, you know, personally, kind of like this self-gratification worship that we get nowadays is self-gratification. It's not about God. Because we don't stop the service in the middle of a worship service to see if somebody's crying or somebody's hurting. Or stop and all the church stops together and goes over and lays hands on that person and prays for them. Or do we? See, some churches sometimes will do that, even some Calvary chapels. But I've been part of what was called a community church at one time. I've been part of intimate brothers who got together before we got so organized that we were no good to God anymore. Or we're only as good as is organized and pre-planned and pre-programmed. But... When you let God lead you, you'll find that in the brokenhearted, in the desperately needy, in those that are crying out to God, you will be ministered to. You will find greater satisfaction in the intimacy of two people holding each other's pinkies without breaking them than you'll find in the great congregations of thousands standing there worshiping God in some preordained ministerial type of way that thousands and millions of people are all standing there watching from their video monitor at home or their satellite service being broadcast to everyone distant but no one intimate. That's not Jesus' church. The intimacy of the relationship that God wanted for you is the unity of the body of believers where you can say we are one, not many. And can you say that about anyone that you know at church? Do you know them? Or do you just go around them? That's what Jesus wants to know. Are you willing to become his body of believers? Where the intimacy of knowing another person challenges you to the utmost, strives and struggles you to really find where's the love, and you find it really in denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Jesus to accept even the most despicable of sinners that Jesus welcomed as one of his disciples. That person is you.